Good morning and welcome to our fifth lecture in the seminar dealing with the lifetimes and work of Ludwig von Mises. This morning we are dealing with uh, uh, Mises' socialist calculation argument uh, in, a, in a chapter that I call uh, the Copernican shift as a reference to uh, the complete reorientation in, uh, in scientific thinking that arrived with Copernicus. Uh, as you know, Copernicus uh, was, was said to be, actually he was not, but was said to be uh, the first scientist who conceived that uh, actually the earth was turning around the sun, whereas all previous people, uh, scholars had believed, uh, according to this uh, account, that uh, it was the other way around, that the sun uh, was turning around the earth. Now, it's a little bit the same thing here, because Mises completely reshaped the debate about socialism. Before Mises, it was commonly taken for granted that uh, socialism uh, could work and uh, could, by and large, use the same techniques of management uh, and economic organization as capitalist economies. And Mises fundamentally put this, uh, uh, this contention into question, uh, and he showed that it was not true. It's not true that we can use the same techniques and uh, organizational procedures in the two systems. So we have a uh, Copernican shift. Um, and I deal with this Copernican shift in two chapters of the Mises biography. The first one concerning the publication of the paper in uh, which Mises uh, put forward this uh, socialist calculation argument, a 1920 paper, of the title Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. And then I have another chapter uh, dealing with the Treatise on Socialism that he published two years later in 1922, a book with the title Die Gemeinwirtschaft, the Commonwealth, or translated in English as Socialism. And it is a true treatise on socialism. Now, since uh, our time is, is limited, I'll uh, focus heavily on uh, this first uh, publication, the paper, the 1920 paper, and give some intellectual background. So uh, we'll uh, uh, talk about uh, the emergence of the paper, uh, what were the predecessors, what was the intellectual context, uh, then how uh, Mises' arguments uh, triumphed, and, how it, and they had an immediate and very strong impact on economic thought in those days, and then also explain why their impact was finally also limited, as even though there was a, a firestorm created at the, at the publication, the longer-term impact uh, only arised as from the 1940s when Mises could uh, present a full picture of a socialist calculation argument. And then uh, at the end of my talk, I'll, I'll briefly, and we'll see how much time uh, will be left, I'll briefly come to talk about his treatise on socialism and point out the main contributions that he makes in this book. Nineteen nineteen, we have said the socialists suddenly were in power. Uh, their success was somewhat mitigated as uh, from the February elections uh, in Austria, but in other countries they had a very sweeping success. There were in fact uh, communist dictatorships in Hungary and in Bavaria, and these lasted uh, several months throughout uh, nineteen nineteen. So until roughly speaking the summer of nineteen nineteen. Anything seemed to go. Anything was possible in Central Europe. The central powers had been shaken, because they were bankrupt, out of funds, uh, demoralized. Uh, the economic, economic and political establishment uh, was uh, uh, driven out of power. And the socialists were in place. And they could have, if they had had the determination to do it, uh, established a socialist uh, a political regime. Now, yesterday we have seen that uh, in the case of the Vienna Socialists, they didn't do it because they finally uh, came to be convinced by Mises' argument that this would be a very short-lived experience in, in the winter of 1918-1919 because they could not overcome the problem of uh, food supplies, which would have lasted only uh, eight days. But this, of course, would not have been a con decisive consideration in the longer run. Okay, you wait for the spring, you wait for the summer, the harvests come in and so on, you'll be sure to survive uh, for a couple of weeks and even, even months if, if necessary, and you will be able possibly to set up your socialist experiment. So, uh, why didn't they do it? 
And the answer is that they were intellectually completely unprepared. And this is uh, something that, that Mises first uh, underscored, but he was not the only one. Later historians, uh, be they uh, sympathetic to Mises' cause or be they socialists, underlined exactly the same point. Uh, the socialist leadership of those days was intellectually unprepared for the uh, challenges it was now facing, because the great question was, okay, not only how do you socialize, well, this uh, might be simply a matter of the will and technical question. You just abolish private property in the means of production. You say now the government that is the representative of the nation as a whole, of society as a whole, is from now on the only owner of all factors of production, of all uh, production sites and so on. Uh, that's one thing. But then the question is, how do you manage actually the socialist economy? How do you run it? According, what are your criteria to make uh, production decisions? That is, setting up new plants, for example, or shutting down old plants, uh, extending production to what extent, and so on. Why this unpreparedness? Why did the socialists not care to uh, to address in previous writings, in previous reflection, this rather obvious question. The answer is that uh, Karl Marx himself had shut down any discussion of this question as unscientific. You have to remember that Karl Marx uh, proposed the thesis that socialism was not a question of the will, it was a matter, the, the advent of socialism was a matter of natural law. Uh, 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 Marx thought that he had perceived the, uh, he had understood the, the laws according to which the social world transformed itself in the course of time, the historical laws of change of human society. And according to these laws, it was a matter of necessity that one day or another, socialism would just arrive. And since this was completely independent of the human will, well, it was just uh, completely unnecessary and even uh, uh, small-minded to, to raise the question how this would, this would work. Well, it would simply be there at, at some point, and then, well, people would know how to run it. Okay? And the most plausible scenario that he gave was, of course, that, well, you have an increasing concentration of production, uh, monopolization tendency in capitalism, creation of ever greater monop monopolies, until at the very end, you just have one monopoly, one firm running the entire country. Okay, and then you just topple the management of this firm by the government, this re representative of, of the proletariat, and you just do what they always did before. Okay, you just do, go on pushing on the same buttons and so on. That was about the most plausible scenario that me, uh, Marx could offer. Now, whatever the legitimacy or pertinence of this point of view, in any case, it was not at all the situation that the socialists in Central Europe confronted in 1919. There was no one big monopoly running all the country. Okay, There were still lots of firms. There was still a market economy, uh, despite uh, the uh, centralizing tendency of the war economy. Decision-making was, to a very large extent, still cent decentralized. And uh, whatever uh, the pertinence of the Mar Marxian uh, precept uh, might have been, well, it could not be directly applied. And the socialists did not have an, did not have an answer either. Right? Otto Bauer did not have an answer. Max uh, Adler did not have an answer. And Karl Kautsky, uh, the number one uh, theoretician and um, prime authority in all questions, Marxists, uh, at that time, uh, did not have an answer either. So in this context, uh, in the fall of 1919, Mises writes uh, his paper on uh, the problem of economic calculation, which was meant to be a part of his new treatise on, on socialism. Um, he must have started working on this directly after the publication of the previous book in which he analyzed the causes of World War I and, and the further consequences, a book with the title Nation, State and Economy. Uh, I have in the Mises biography a chapter dedicated to this book, I completely neglected in the seminar. Well, simply, we cannot do everything. Uh, so there, there is, after all, a reason for those of you uh, who, who find this uh, stuff interesting to buy the book 
<laughs> and read the, read the chapter. So in any case, I, I might say that in this book he anticipates several of his um, uh, main theses that he develops more fully through, uh, throughout the 1920s, but we'll leave it at that. So he publishes this book in the summer of 1919, and supposedly he must have started working on his treatise on socialism immediately thereafter. And the way he, he does this, well, uh, was um, uh, work in the evening and night hours. Uh, he's, after all, a full-time uh, day job at the Chamber of Commerce. He's teaching a seminar. He has various obligations uh, as a, a member of the government. And uh, so the only time left to write any such thing is in the evening hours. So now we can, in retrospect, say, well, thanks be to God that Jesus was not married. Right? and had children and so on, because this would have not have left him any time to do it. And so he returns home, and, well, he's still full of energy, and sets out to write. Uh, think and write, well, whatever, four, five, six hours, sometimes into the night, and then finally creates a treatise of some 500 pages in the course of two years. He had a good incentive to uh, hurry up with this uh, work because uh, uh, there was an ever so slight chance that he might obtain a chair of economics at the University of Vienna because Friedrich uh, von Wieser was up to retirement. He was up to retire in 1922. So if Mises by then could have published a third book, uh, a major book, this might have greatly increased his chances. And in fact, he, he managed to publish this book uh, just at the time when Visa retired and, the, and there was therefore this opening, but it didn't help him. Right? There was another person who got the job who had not published even a single book at this time. Uh, well, so th this might be injustice, but that's how things are still today. So in a nation state and economy, Mises had laid the, the groundwork in a, in a way for the argument that he would now de develop more fully. First of all, uh, he had uh, discussed the, the traditional uh, argument brought up against socialist experiments, namely that it would greatly diminish the incentives for people to work. And if you are paid according to your needs, uh, everybody should work according to his abilities and be paid according to uh, his needs. And of course, the incentive to work is not uh, very great because, well, you are paid according to your needs. The needs remain whether <laughs> you have worked hard or whether you have been sloppy. Okay. Uh, now, the socialist uh, uh, re uh, responded to this, that in a socialist society, things would be completely different. Incentives would no longer be what they were before. Suddenly, there would be a joy of work. Work would no longer be a nuisance. Um, no longer be bearing on the other workers, but would be joyful because now finally they would not work for somebody else, for the evil capitalist, but for themselves. All oh, co-owners now they enjoy uh, exploiting the full potential of, of, of their work. Now Mises uh, retorted to this rather dryly that if ever there was such a society in which people had a very uh, strong collective uh, identity and were ready to sacrifice themselves uh, for the, the common cause, this was Germany under Bismarck. And now Mises observed, well, even in Germany, it did not work. And he had the fresh experience of, of the war years. And in fact, if you uh, I encourage those of you who are interested in these, in these things to read uh, good accounts, uh, detailed accounts of the German war economy in, in World War I, it was, was great um, uh, effort, uh, good, uh, goodwill on the side of the overwhelming majority of the population to, uh, to support the government in its, uh, in its activities. Uh, just to give you one example, the Germans... Uh, contributed uh, voluntarily and speedily to a gold collection to prop up the uh, the gold reserves of the central bank. Okay, uh, so whereas in all other kind of typically when you create a paper money, which was done in Germany at the beginning of the war to finance the war effort, well, all people hold back with their gold. They 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 hoard their gold coins because they know well the gold coins will now only be worth the same thing as the devalued paper. 
In Germany, it was the opposite that happened. The people now readily delivered their gold to, to the central bank. And this was not compulsory. It was just a, a voluntary collection, and people did this. There was some imposition of this uh, legal uh, uh, obligation to, to uh, surrender one's gold, but only at the very end of the war, 1917-1918. So in the first uh, uh, two or three years of the war, the people were happy to give their gold to the government. So you have, in a way, from a psychological point of view, you have the ideal population that apparently epitomizes uh, the socialist ideal man, uh, as a collectivist mind. And now Mises says, even with these people, uh, unheard of phenomenon in the history of, of mankind, it did not work. It just, they just ran down the economy. Or as I've quoted him yesterday, they organized defeat. Okay. Then second, he brought up a very different consideration, and it is this consideration that he would fully now develop in, in, uh, in this new paper. So in nation state and economy, he pointed out that monetary calculation also, as he said, value calculation has a very important role to play in allocating factor of uh, factors of production, that is in allocating capital goods, or still in other words, in organizing production. This problem, Mises pointed out, did not exist in a static society, that is, in a society in which all things would simply repeat themselves from one day to another. It's always the same routine that's going on. Here you would not need necessarily something like value calculation because you would simply repeat what you did the, the day before. But things are very different once you have a dynamic economy, that is, an economy that is subject to change. Here, factors of production are used up, they are destroyed in the process uh, of production. And uh, the new production processes that you launch are not necessarily repetitions of what you did in the past. It's something, uh, sometimes something new. So how do you know which production processes are more important than others? And right? We still have the problem of scarcity. We still need to decide out of the uncountable production possibilities, the uncountable production projects that we could realize, which are the ones that are here and now the most important ones? How do we know? And here it says, well, value calculus comes into play. It delivers us a criterion to decide which production projects are more important than other ones. So we have an ordinal ranking of production projects, and we cut, can cut short within the constraints of our budget. We realize only the most important ones. Now, he presented his new paper in early January 1920 at a talk, uh, in, a, in a talk at the Nationalökonomische Gesellschaft, the economics club that he himself had set up already before the war, which now involved no longer the students that they were before, but well, established scholars. And here, he first stressed this point again. Economic uh, calculus is vital for factor allocation. And there, by and large, there was no disagreement with, uh, between him and, and his audience. Well, who was the audience? Well, his friends, as I said. Well, it was not only friends, not only buddies, but good acquaintances, people who would respect one another. And uh, they were um, either interventionist or uh, outright socialist. So by and large, that was the audience. Okay, it was uh, next to him uh, no uh, classical liberal in in this club. Now, but then Mises uh, made two proposed two uh, uh, central points. First, he now argued that socialist societies cannot rely on economic calculation in the same way as capitalist societies can do this. Why is this so? The calculus that we perform or that a businessman performs relies on money prices. What he essentially does is to compare uh, the spending streams, that is the selling receipts that he obtains for his products, to the cost expenditure that he makes on factors of production. Now, let's say he has two investment projects. The first one uh, 
he obtains $120,000 and, and he spends $100,000. And in the other one, he obtains $130,000 and he will have to spend $100,000. So the first one, he obtains then 20% return on investment and in the second one, 30%. So he has um, a criterion to compare these two uh, action alternatives. Okay, so that's the essence of economic calculation. But obviously it relies on previously existing money prices. Strictly speaking, not previously existing, but potentially existing money prices because your comparison is run in terms of money prices. This is what makes heterogeneous goods comparable. The products resulting from the first production process may be milk and the uh, products resulting from the second production process is maybe a, a, con con a concerto. These products are physically heterogeneous. You cannot compare them. The factors of production needed for uh, the two of them are different too. In order to produce milk, you need, among other things, cows or maybe goats. And in order to produce a concerto, you need musicians. So training for musicians also. Instruments. That's not the same thing as cows. So you have heterogeneous, physically heterogeneous economic goods. You cannot compare them in terms of a common unit in a barter economy, but you can compare them in terms of money prices. Now, why is such a thing not possible in the case of a socialist economy? Well, because in a socialist economy, you have by definition only one owner of all means of production. All factors of production are owned by the government or by society, if you wish. But if there's just one owner, then there can be no exchange. It cannot be exchanged against one another. And if there's no exchange, then obviously there's no money price. So in such an economy, only consumer goods could, at the very best, have money prices, but not factors of production. As a consequence, you cannot compare the prices for consumer goods with the prices of factors of production because the latter do not exist. And as a consequence, you can also not compare the profitabilities of different investment projects. So the thesis holds. In a socialist society, one cannot rely on price accounting as one can in a capitalist society. And now comes thesis number two. And Mises says, well, and there is, by the way, no other way to perform economic calculation. You cannot perform economic calculation in terms of labor units, for example. Um, because, well, first of all, there are other factors of production besides labor. And second, labor is heterogeneous too. Uh, you cannot compare the precious work of Richard Perry with uh, the meager services of uh, Matthew Mackay. Right? Any is that it's not obvious how you could compare them. It's not the same thing. So we don't have an homogeneous unit here. You cannot just com cannot uh, perform an economic calculus. Okay. So now Mises has uh, proposed a fundamental challenge to all those who want to run, want to manage a socialist society. If his argument holds true then we have a fundamental problem here that has nothing to do with any psychological disposition or incentive problem, as it had been traditionally stressed by the 19th century classical liberals. Right? Still, it would hold true that people have incentive problems. Right? Or maybe they have not. Or maybe it's, in fact, true that there would be a new socialist man. But even if there were a new socialist man full of the best will and ready to sacrifice himself entirely to the common cause, uh, even if you were imbued with the Holy Ghost and were angel-like, uh, would be moving through the economy, he could not calculate. So we have the, the fundamental criterion that is uh, taken by both socialists and economists to be the embodiment of economic rationality does not exist in a socialist society. What was the intellectual context of this uh, argument? What Mises' thesis amounts to is, in fact, a refoundation of the theory of production along completely new, uh, new lines. 
Uh, if Mises is right, then at the center of the economic theory of production, how things are being produced, is the theory of economic calculation. And in fact, that's exactly what he will explain in more detail in the 1940s when he publishes his treatises of, of economics. And both national economy and the English language successor, human action, have the same structure. Mises first deals with uh, human action uh, in a world without market prices. Uh, first, human action with, even without uh, outside of society, isolated human action, then human action in society, but yet not, not yet uh, with market prices. And then comes a third part in the book in which he deals with the theory of economic calculation. And only once we have dealt with economic calculation can we meaningfully talk about the market economy. Because the distinguishing characteristic of a market economy is the possibility to calculate. And then he can discuss, go on and discuss other forms of social cooperation, like interventionism and socialism. But doing so... Uh, this, uh, this new approach to the theory of production fundamentally contradicted the prevailing wisdom at the time, which uh, was embodied in John Stuart, Mill, John Stuart Mill's dogma that production and distribution were two completely disjointed economic problems. The distinction between production, distribution, and consumption goes back to Jean-Baptiste de Say, who was the first one to produce, uh, suggest this division, but Say had not necessarily believed that you could, I mean, you could uh, separate these things for uh, pedagogical exposition, but that does not mean that they're completely disjointed uh, phenomena. But that's what, what Mill claimed. Mill said, in fact, we have here uh, separate problems. I will quote for, for you from uh, John Stuart Mill. He says, it is evident that of the two great departments of political economy, the production of wealth and its distribution, the consideration of value has to do with the latter alone. It is only with distribution. And with that, only so far as competition and not usage or custom is the distributing agency. The conditions and laws of production would be the same as they are, if the arrangements of society did not depend on exchange or did not admit of it. So, value theory, let's say price theory also, concerns only distribution within a market economy. It does not even concern distribution in a socialist economy, or whatever other economy there might be. And it has nothing at all to do with production. Production is a purely technological problem that would be therefore be addressed in exactly the same way in a market economy as in any other type of economy. Now, this was also the prevailing wisdom in, in, uh, in Austria, in particular in the work of Friedrich von Wieser, about whom we have already talked and who will still occupy his IAS uh, uh, tomorrow. Only Wieser was original in that he turned Mill's scheme upside down. Visa, Visa agreed with Mill that the two realms of production and distribution were completely separate. But he argued that value theory concerned production. And that, in fact, it was a universal theory concerning production in any type of social organization. Socialism and capitalism. Whereas distribution had nothing to do with value whatsoever, distribution could occur according to virtually any criterion, exchange of property rights in a market economy, but also subsidies being paid out of a common purse uh, in a socialist economy, and so on. So value theory is a truly universal theory of production. And it is truly, in terms of value, that the economic calculus is being performed, not necessarily in terms of money. Money is just one particular case. Or money accounting, money price accounting is just one particular case of value calculus. Now, this uh, prevailing wisdom 
had come under attack from a from the young Russian Marxist by the name of Nikolai Bukharin. Bukharin later on became the chief economist in the Soviet Union. And he was, in the early 1900s, a member of Bumbavec Seminar. He wanted to inform himself firsthand about the doctrines of the Austrian school. And Bukharin then published uh, a book in which he criticized the Austrian value theory. And the, the title of the book is, I believe, The Economic Theory of the of the leisure class, the economic theory of the leisure class. That's the English title. Here, uh, Bukharin argued that value theory is not universal. As a matter of fact, it is not universal because the market prices being paid in a capitalist uh, economy did not just depend on available quantities and human needs. They also depended on lots of contingent factors such as property rights and so on. So this uh, value theory and obviously production did depend on, on the prices as they existed on the market because the prices would determine which products are profitable and which are not. Now Mises' uh, position created a, a synthesis of uh, uh, a new synthesis that included parts of the Bukharian critique but reformulated it from the point of view of his insights about economic calculation. We can summarize Mises' position in three points. First, calculation is indeed historically contingent. So on this point, he sides with Bukharin. It's true that value theory, at least in the form, well, let's say the theory of economic calculation, is not something that can be universally applied to all forms of social organization but is constrained by the presence of a system of private property rights and factors of production. Only in such a system can we perform economic calculation. And of course, such systems do not exist at all times in all places. They only exist at certain times. In certain places, they are historically contingent. And so there are cultural factors that come into play that make for the presence of these conditions. Second, uh, and contrary to Bukharin, this does not play out against capitalism, but it plays out against socialism and the socialist theories. And, uh, precisely because economic calculation is historically contingent, well, it means that an efficient social organization depends on these contingent factors. It depends on the presence of private property rights for means of production. It cannot, we cannot have economic calculation where these conditions are lacking. Third, uh, Mill's dogma is wrong. Mill's doctrine, doctrine of the separation between distribution and production is wrong. Uh, it's precisely because um, uh, production decisions depend on market prices. Uh, that, and because, uh, therefore, production uh, is uh, is higher in a capitalist society than in a, than it could be in a socialist society, that also distribution will be different, will necessarily be affected. And the distribution, in turn, cannot fail to affect production because depending on the distribution of uh, of income, well, people will spend their their income on different items. That is, they will affect uh, the market prices differently. Mises' uh, thesis, Mises' socialist calculation argument, relied uh, quite essentially on a certain vision, a certain clarification of uh, value theory, as he had proposed it in his uh, theory of money and credit. Now, this is somewhat surprising, uh, because, well, the, uh, it was this was supposed to be a book dealing with um, uh, with, with money and banking. And Mises also deals there with value theory. Now, how is this? Well, recall what I told you yesterday. Mises himself tells us in his autobiographical notes and recollections that the book was conceived to be already a treatise of, 
uh, of the monetary economy, presupposing a detailed analysis of a non-monetary economy or a barter economy. So from the outset, he planned a treatise of, of economics. But he didn't have the time to do this. Therefore, he concentrated only on the monetary aspect. So, But still, he did very briefly, very concisely, in the first part of the book, what was meant to be dealt with more fully if he had had the time to do it. So, among other things, he dealt with value theory. Why did he deal with value the theory? Well, because he was not happy with the present state of value theory at the time. He could no longer fully endorse the value theory as it had been proposed by Menger and Bavak. So what was the crucial point? Uh, the crucial point of departure was that uh, Mises conceived of value as uh, a comparative phenomenon. It's, it's a relation, if you wish. Uh, this point was um, uh, present in Karl Menger's analysis of value and of marginal value in particular, but not in Karl Menger's definition of value. Karl Menger defined value uh, somewhat in deviation from his actual analysis of value. In Menger's analysis of value, value was conceived to be a substance, the precise nature of which was not clarified. Now, Mises in the theory of money and credit tells us that value is not a substance, but a relationship. It con concerns the relation of priority between different choice alternatives. So value is ordinal. It is relative. A relation. It is not a quantity. Mises had emphasized these heterodox observations and then went on to define value as being inextricably bound up to human choices. Now comes a quote from the theory of money and credit. Every economic transaction presupposes a comparison of values. But the necessity for such a comparison, as well as the possibility of it, is due only to the circumstance that the person concerned has no uh, has to choose between several commodities. That is, now value is bound up with choices. Does not mean that uh, value is a matter of choice. We can, by our choice, determine what what the objective value of, of things is. But value can only be de defined in the context of a choice. With these lines, Mises sets the Austrian theory of value on a completely new trajectory. Karl Menger had resolutely rejected the notion that the phenomenon of value could somehow depend on human choices. He believed that any reference to free will in this context, quote, would deny economics altogether the status of an exact science, unquote. So for Menger, as soon as we bring choice in, well, we, human choice in, we're in the realm of arbitrariness can no longer be an exact law. A law for Menger was something, law, law, social law was, had to be something independent of choice. He therefore stressed the will independent factors determining the pricing process. Market prices, according to Menger, resulted ultimately from individual needs that had to be satisfied with scarce means. He realized that human beings had to have, quote, knowledge of this causal connection, unquote, between means and ends. But he paid scant attention to the subjective factor. In Menger's account, the theory of value and prices was a subdivision of some sort of a platonic theory of goods. With Mises, it became part of a reality-based theory of human action. Now, as you can imagine, you have a, you have a, wrong, a young writer making these points without uh, any in-depth discussion, just stating these points in a book supposed to be dealing with money and, and banking. Okay, you can imagine what the impact of these observations had been on the profession at the time, or those interested in economics. Well, those who respected Mises. Uh, certainly respected also this uh, attention, uh, th th this point and paid attention to it. But for most people, this must have been, uh, the idiosyncrasies 
of uh, a young economist aiming to be original. So they were not common knowledge at the time he wrote his paper on economic calculation in a socialist economy. But in fact, his argument quite substantively relied on this thesis which he had developed or which he had stated in the theory of money and credit. Now, this explains why the impact of his new argument proved to be limited before the war. And I'll come back to talk about this later. But now let's first uh, talk about the, the triumph of his thesis. Uh, because Mises' thesis had uh, a huge impact, especially once he had presented it, pre he had presented this paper within his general treatise on socialism, which was published in 1922. In fact, Mises was independently confirmed by three sources and unexpected sources, was not part of his uh, professional network, as we might say today. The first uh, confirmation came from Max Weber, was a great authority in social science in, in the Germanys in those days, that is, in the world in those days. Here we have a photo of Max Weber as a young man. Still in the 19th century, well, he looked somewhat different in those days. Max Weber had died at a relatively early age in 1922. And in the year of his death, posthumously, uh, his friends published his magnum opus with the title Economy and Society, so Wirtschaft und Gesellschaft. And here Weber made exactly the same point about the impossibility of socialist calculation that Mises had made in his 1920 paper. And in fact, uh, he, his book Economy and Society quoted Mises' paper, saying that in the meantime, the following article has appeared, which also makes this point. So, apparently, Weber had independently arrived uh, at this conclusion. Uh, there are, however, reasons to, to question this. It's, it's the following. Mises knew Weber. So, they had met one another in the summer semester of 1918, when, uh, when Weber had come to Vienna and uh, gave various lectures at the university. And in the course of uh, his sojourn in Vienna, he met uh, with Mises and they, in fact, befriended one another. And so we must assume that they discussed various uh, points of common interest, uh, among them value theory. And so, it, at least it's conceivable that Mises brought up his uh, observations already on, um, on this occasion and that then uh, Weber simply made uh, added one and one uh, added one point to another and came up with very similar conclusions. And uh, this scenario is plausible for another reason, namely the following. In, uh, in one of his, uh, his lectures in 1918, Weber talked about the socialist state or the socialist economy. This lecture was later on published. It's a 50 or 60 page uh, lecture. And here he talks about various aspects uh, of uh, the problematic nature of a socialist economy, but not about this one. Okay, so by then, Weber, for one, I, I either neglected this point, which is implausible, or more plausibly, he was just ignorant of this aspect. So it, we, we can uh, plausibly argue that probably Mises had an inf impact on Weber, had, uh, had an influence on Weber at the same, um, uh, on this occasion. But anyway, what was important for Mises, for the success of Mises' argument in the early 1920s was that Weber made exactly the same point. It was not just this young economist from Vienna, well, at the time he was already uh, 41 years old, uh, but it was the, the great authority of the historical school, Max Weber. Uh, Mises was also confirmed, although this, this did not pertain, this did not have an impact on the German debate, by a, a Russian economist uh, of the name of Boris Brutskos. Boris Brutskos um, uh, also was more or less directly influenced by, uh, by Mises uh, in, the, in the following way. When Mises published his book uh, Socialism, 
three Marxists, uh, Russian Marxists, responded with critical reviews to this book in, uh, in a Russian uh, paper in Russian. So Mises didn't, wasn't aware of, of, of these publications. And then Brutzko saw, saw these and then went on to defend Mises' thesis. Okay. So Brutzko hadn't read uh, socialism at the time. He just uh, read the critiques of Mises' argument in socialism, and he would then more fully uh, develop the argument, which which was not uh, present in, in the critiques that had been published by these Russian Marxists. So we come then to a second uh, important confirmation of Mises' thesis, and this is a rather was a rather unexpected one, namely a practical one, in the form of the new economic policy introduced by Lenin in Soviet Russia as from about the same time, 1922. Okay, so Lenin first had pursued a radical program of socialization, abolishment of private property in the means of production, and then in the early 1920s, he completely changed orientation, uh, and he reintroduced private property, uh, in particular for agricultural production, but also for various other things. So what could be more striking than this practical, empirical confirmation of the thesis that Mises had made on rather theoretical grounds? But then third, and most importantly, came a confirmation from, uh, a, from a theoretician, or from, a, let's say, from a scholar in a completely unsuspected camp, namely from Heinrich Herkner, H-E-R-K-N-E-R, the successor to Gustav Schmoller. Gustav Schmoller had died in 1917, and Herkner was his successor, both uh, to his chair at the University of Berlin, but also as a president of the Verein für Sozialpolitik, the Association for Social Policy. So Herkner, in 1922, at the 50th anniversary uh, meeting, of the Association for Social Policy, uh, pointed out that there were exaggerations uh, in the belief in, in statism, that the young economists no longer knew the case for free trade, that they were ignorant of theoretical economics, and that all this was bad. And he went on to praise a new literature that had emerged and that uh, seemed to furnish a promising new point of departure. I will quote uh, what he said about this new literature. Yeah, here's what he said. He urged his colleagues to thoroughly examine the ideas of these new theoretical economists, stating, We encounter by far the most important performance of this line of research in the brilliantly written and inspired work by the Vienna economist Ludwig Mises, Die Gemeinwirtschaft, with full command of the most recent scientific achievements and partly on the basis of new points of view, the author quite devastatingly criticizes all variants of socialism and everything that he considers to be socialism. Now this took Mises' book from the limited exposure of the ivory tower and made it infamous throughout the socialist movement. The unheard of concessions and even praise for one of the hated theorists caused outrage in the labor unions and angry reassessments of Herkner's position in official socialist circles. Yet Herkner's authority also forced the German mainstream economists to reevaluate their cherished scientific and political tenets. The influential Heinrich Pesch recognized Mises as the head of a new Manchesterism. He explained, because of his, as so a quote, because of his clever and original critique of socialism, Mises has met with regard and approval even among those authors who, in distinct contrast to him, advocate the legal protection of children and women and compulsory workers' insurance. So this was a sweeping success, and Mises was suddenly in the limelight. 
uh, of the of the attention. And I, as I will argue uh, more fully uh, th this afternoon, uh, we have here the beginning of a, a first Mises revolution. Mises revolution in economic thought, limited in those days to the German-speaking world. And uh, we uh, this, uh, this the strong impact that uh, Mises would have would make itself felt at an accelerating rate in the late 1920s and early 1930s. And it was stopped only by the ascension of Hitler to power. From then on, of course, uh, Mises uh, was on the blacklist of wanted men and his works were on the blacklist of the books to be taken out of libraries and so on. Uh, so this stopped it and uh, that's how things would remain until a second Mises revolution would set in in the 1950s, subject of, of our uh, last talks on Friday. Now, but even in the 1920s, this Mises revolution was incomplete. Uh, he had uh, proposed, uh, at, at the heart of his new uh, uh, approach, was the, uh, was the distinction between value and price. Of course, that's the traditional Austrian distinction that Menger had made and that Bimbavec had made. But Mises uh, now uh, set out to emphasize the implications of this distinction for economic calculation. Uh, and the important uh, phrase here is he set out to, because it was not yet clear in the early 1920s. Uh, it was clear in the 1940s. So I'll quote for you, so that we have a standard of res reference, I'll quote for you uh, what he said uh, in, uh, in 19, uh, 1949 in Human Action. He said the following. One can add up prices expressed in terms of money, but not scales of preference, that is, value scales. One cannot divide values or single out quotas of them. A value judgment never consists in anything other than preferring A to B. There's nothing to be added up, to be subtracted, to be multiplied with, because it's a relationship. It's a preference relationship. You can add up, subtract, multiply only extended units such as money prices. So Mises went on. The process of value imp imputation does not result in derivation of the value of the single productive agents from the value of their joint product. It does not bring about results which could serve as elements of economic calculation. It is only the market that in establishing prices for each factor of production, creates the conditions required for economic calculation. Economic calculation always deals with prices, never with values. Okay, so we retain this last sentence. Economic calculation always deals with prices, never with values. This sentence sums it all up. But that's 1949, right? And we find a similar sentence in this 1940 German predecessor treatise. But in 1920 and 1922, he did not put matters that clearly. So in these early works, he even uses uh, formulas such as value calculation and calculation of value. Now that's very confusing. Right? Because readers must have inferred from this that he was in fundamental agreement with Visa's position. Right? There is such a thing as a universal value theory that applies to all production processes and so on. It's clear why his thesis could not have the smashing impact that it would have much later once it had been formulated clearly. Uh, so Mises' impact in the 1920s and 1930s was limited because himself was not quite clear on these issues. It had a very thorough impact, only as from the 1950s, because uh, by then he had formulated his mature expositions of the theory. Now, let's come to talk a little bit about his, his treatise on socialism, a uh, book with the title, English title, Socialism, uh, which had a great impact on the rising generation of economists. You can read various uh, luminaries of the post-World War II classical liberal movement, or Renaissance, 
uh, who, who said that the book had a decisive impact on their intellectual uh, development. This is, of course, most notably the case um, uh, of uh, Friedrich August von Hayek, about whom we'll talk this afternoon, uh, but also Wilhelm Röpke, Lionel Robbins, Fritz Maklub, various others. So it's a very important book. And uh, uh, a true treatise, Mises delivers a comprehensive, systematic analysis of all aspects of uh, socialism. He elaborated four general theses. First, the promises of socialism were empty because its program for a central direction of production was a theoretical and practical impossibility. So that's an elaboration of his 1920 paper. Second, there was no process of social evolution that necessarily led to socialist regimes, something that he had not addressed in the 1920 paper, which confronted head-on the Marxist thesis that there were laws of social evolution that by necessity of natural law led to a socialist state. So Mises explained that's, that's not true either. Uh, socialism might come, but it will not come by natural law. Uh, the future is open. Third, none of the major ethical justifications of socialism stood up to rational scrutiny. And this concern, in particular, the vindications of uh, Christian socialism, a new intellectual movement that had arisen as from uh, the middle of the 19th century. Fourth, the true character of socialism was not to improve the human condi condition, but to worsen it, because socialist policies destroy the capital base of society. So socialism is the same thing as destructionism. That's what it is. War wartime socialism organized defeat. Socialism in general destroys capital. Therefore, it destroys civilization. Now, I'll uh, present to you a, a short list of, of, of ten major points that, that he argues in, in socialism, ten original points. Okay. First, so I mean the, the four points that I presented before, these were the general uh, parts of the theory, the general headings, uh, general four theses, but there were uh, ten uh, original uh, um, tenets or, or new ideas that Mises proposed in, in his argument. First, he explained that the benefits derived from uh, means of production under ca uh, capitalism uh, do not accrue only to capitalists, but to all members of society. Um, that is the, the common presentation by um, socialist authors that um, uh, private property and the means of production is beneficial only to the haves, not to the have-nots, is a misrepresentation of fact. Uh, because if you own a machine or a factory, well, the fact is you cannot consume, you cannot eat or otherwise enjoy this machine or factory. You only benefit from it to the extent that you benefit from the products that are being made with these factors of production. Now, the beneficiaries of these products are, of course, all members of society. It's not just those who own the factors of production. Or quite to the contrary, we would, we would have to say that, especially in the case of mass production, and if we produce uh, uh, cars, for example, it's not Henry Ford who was the main beneficiary of his, of his product. It was all the, the consumers of cars, all the users of cars who were the beneficiaries right? and who then paid him in exchange. Second, Mises made a utilitarian case for democracy. He argued that... Um, <clears throat> One could not defend democracy in the light of moral considerations, for example, considerations that uh, were based on natural law conceptions, because Mises did not believe that there could be a signs of morals or signs of natural law. For him, these were just expressions of uh, judgments of value, of personal preferences. but There were no matters of fact to be established in, 
uh, in these fields. And therefore, there could be no signs of natural law. There could be no signs of ethics. So if ever there is to be uh, made a case for, uh, for democracy, it would have to be based on a consideration of fact. Now, Mises proposes the following argument. He says, well, it is in the common interest of all members of society that production be as efficient as possible. Now, one fundamental presupposition of production is that uh, social relations are peaceful. You cannot very well cooperate with your neighbor if you are at the same time slapping yourself on your head or shooting yourself. It's not much of a cooperation. So the question is, how can we ensure that social relations remain peaceful? What are the main occasions for unpeaceful social relations? Well, there's crime. But as far as uh, social organization is concerned, well, it concerns uh, the, the choice of government, and the choice of a political system. And people have different preferences. So how can we avoid that these different orientations or preferences lead to war, lead to conflict, lead to violent conflict? Well, and he says, here he says, democracy comes into play. What democracy does is to assure a peaceful transition from one government to another and conceivably also from one political system to another. It pacifies social relationships. Third, Mises proposed uh, an original economic analysis of the family. So political economy of the family. And he did so in order to counter the feminist claim that marriage was a, a, a vestige of power, a vestige of uh, exploitation of females. Now, there was uh, an analogy between the argument of these uh, radical feminists and the socialists that, that Mises uh, perceived very clearly. And the analogy is the following. Uh, Marx, for example, had praised capitalism as uh, the system that unfettered the uh, productive forces of society. But, said Marx, there's still a constraint in capitalism, namely private property. We can unfetter the productive forces even more if we get rid of private property. We increase, can increase liberty and therefore also productivity even more by getting rid of this this last vestige of, of domination. Now, the feminists argued by analogy. They said, well, the lot of, the f uh, of females, of women, has improved in the, in the course of time, but there's still an ultimate barrier that still exists, that still hampers the full emancipation of women, which is marriage. Marriage enshrines male domination over females. And now Mises argues, well, that that is not the case because... Women, after all, are free to choose whether they get married or not. Now, it might be true that uh, in marriage they cannot fully exploit their productive uh, potentials and so on, but uh, then why? the question is, why do they get married at all? And he says, well, there are positive reasons why females tend to get married. And, they are, uh, and that is that, uh, well, so that, that is Mises' argument, um, uh, because they uh, they seek uh, a family life, they seek to be mothers, and they seek a sexual union with men. Now, he might be wrong on this. That's not our subject, right? But, so the point is, I mean, he raises the fundamental fact is that women are free to, to get married. Right? And especially today, as nobody, as we all know, I mean, clearly in our days, <laughs> women are free to get married. There's no obligation to get married. So why do they do this anyway? So there must be a reason, there must be some benefits that can be derived from marriage. And Mises simply points out, delivers an explanation what these benefits might be. In any case, it's not true that uh, we should come with uh, the government, that is with the law, and prevent females from getting married, uh, from getting uh, married as it was proposed by the feminists. Right? So there's no uh, justification of this. F Fourth, Mises points out several further implications of the calculus, uh, socialist calculation problem. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, concentration of the ownership of means of production makes uh, for tyranny, government tyranny within 
society, so to necessarily leads to a total, totalitarian government. And second, he also points out that uh, the incentive problem that necessarily results from uh, distribution according to one's needs not only concerns labor, but it also concerns capital. Because just as there is no longer an incentive to work, or a diminished incentive to work, there is now also a diminished incentive to save. Right? In a capitalist society, I have an incentive to save because I'm rewarded in the form of interest payments, or well, possibly profit. In a socialist society, this no longer exists. So why should I save? Why should I not consume all economic goods that I can control? But if this incentive exists, then of course the capital base must shrink, and as a consequence, real wage rates must shrink as well. Uh, the, the, the cake that can be distributed must shrink as well. Fifth, uh, Mises now discusses a second basic problem of any socialist economy that he holds to be at least uh, as equally important as the socialist calculation problem. And this problem is the problem of moral hazard. He does not use the word moral hazard, but he describes the phenomenon of irresponsibility or irresponsibilization that results from common property. So if each plant manager uh, were no longer the owner of the plant that he manages, if there were no owner at all of the plants that are being managed, well, then each manager, well, he would just go ahead and do what, what he wishes. He would not bear the negative consequences. There's only, well, a very small part of the negative consequences that would result from bad uh, choices. So the only way to prevent this, as Mises points out, is to impose a systematic set of rules on all those who make management decisions. They must be prevented from being irresponsible. They must be ordered to, uh, their, their, their actions must be channeled into certain uh, lines that are conceived to be uh, less hurtful to the common interest. In other words, socialism, common property, necessarily leads to bureaucracy. It almost forces the government to follow up uh, the creation of uh, common property, the, the abolishment of private property rights, to follow up on this with the creation of large bureaucracies. Economic management can no longer be free and responsible. It must be uh, unresponsible and therefore constrained by rules. So bureaucracy, we have here a theory of bureaucracy, an economic theory of bureaucracy. Sixth, Mises delivers an uh, in-depth critique of John Stuart Mill's analysis of wages. Oh, we already talked about John Stuart Mill, He's the, the gentleman uh, in his old age. Da, 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 da. Uh, yep. a little bit better, but not really. Anyway. Ah. So John uh, Stuart Mill, um, is the most uh, uh, famous classical uh, representative of classical liberalism in, in the 19th century, and uh, while today it is generally acknowledged that Mill also paved the way to socialism. Uh, on theoretical grounds. But Mises was one of the first who pointed this out. Mises was one of the first who led the reaction, it was a critical revision of, of Mill's doctrine, doctrines. And one of these doctrines, where we already mentioned, namely the, uh, the dogma that production and uh, distribution are separate realms. But there was also another unnecessary concession that Mises, uh, that, that Mill had made to uh, socialist theoreticians. Namely, the concession that uh, wages being paid on the market are, uh, do not necessarily correspond to uh, the, the productivity of the, uh, of, the, of the employees. So Mises explains um, that this uh, opinion or this, this thesis is unwarranted because uh, 
um, uh, wage earners can change. There, there can be uh, classes uh, of uh, wage wage classes um, uh, for different wage earners, so that they would have an incentive. To, uh, Always have an incentive to to work as hard as possible to get promoted to the higher paying class. So it was not the case, as Mill has argued, that uh, similar incentive problems would exist in capitalism as they exist in socialism, right? Because um, people would be uh, paid just according to a, uh, a formula that uh, was fixed before, according to the time they work, but not necessarily according to the amount of work that they get done within the time for which they are paid. Right? So Mises argues, well, but there are different pay classes and you have an incentive to be promoted to the next pay class in which you receive a higher payment. Seventh, <clears throat> Mises um, argues that there is a, a, an economic incentive for society to emerge. So he proposes a theory of the emergence of society. And at the heart of this uh, theory is a law that John, uh, sorry, that David Ricardo had developed or discovered in the early 19th century and which was later called the law of comparative costs. So Ricardo had explained why is there a trade between nations um, uh, of, uh, of unequal Abilities, unequal resources. So he took the example of one case, uh, one country that was superior to a, to another country in all respects. It could produce all things more efficiently than the other country. And then he explained that still in this case, there would be trade because, or to the extent that um, the superior country was not equally superior in all respects, but that he would be much more superior in certain uh, production processes than it was in other production processes. Then still there would be a scope for um, a fruitful division of labor. The implication is right, that we never have to fear, and that's the implication that, that Ricardo uh, drew, uh, we never have to fear superior nations. As I always explain to my students uh, in France, uh, who might be frightened through the press, right? We, uh, we get inundated by Chinese goods, and very soon we won't do anything at all anymore. We we'll, won't be any more labor, and we'll all be on the streets and, and, and playing with uh, Chinese dolls and so on. Uh, now, that's not the case. It's actually quite great for us that the Chinese are so productive, and they're doing all these things that we had our, to spend our time producing in the past. So now we simply do other things. Uh, there are certain things that the, even the Chinese don't have time to do, right? and we we should do these things, and uh, and use our special uh, conditions as they prevail, our knowledge and our uh, geographical conditions, and so on, right? That's that's uh, the common task. And if you don't want to do this, well, you're simply lazy, right? You're just not a born entrepreneur, but that's not a reason to step into the way of entrepreneurs who want to do this. Okay, now so Mises, what Mises did was to point out that this uh, law actually holds true not only to exchanges between countries, but to exchanges between any two individuals. Um, now, uh, before him, there were, there were other economists who had uh, pointed out the same thing, most notably Wilfredo Pareto and, uh, uh, and Edgeworth. Uh, 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 Pareto, Edgeworth, and uh, Seligman in the, in the United States. So all three of them had uh, realized that Ricardo's argument holds true, in fact, for any exchange. But none of them had, as, as Mises did, drawn the general inference, well, that what we have here then is an economic theory of socialization, or an economic theory that explains why people do cooperate. Uh, it's, it's the last building block in this theory, that explains to us what are the economic incentives that bring people together, that incite people to cooperate, even if they would be indifferent toward, toward one another for other reasons, or even hate themselves for other reasons. We have here an economic factor that explains why they would still cooperate, or at least have an incentive to cooperate. So we have here a general law of association. That's how he called it, a law of association. The eighth uh, original contribution that Mises made uh, in his argument was to develop a systematic and encompassing theory of monopoly. And we don't have the 
the time now to present this, but I'll just just point it out. Mises' analysis uh, was painstaking and original, and he argued in, in particular um, that uh, there was no tendency as the you know, the Marx empirically it was not the fact that it was a tendency for industrial production to become monopolized. Right? Uh, and the only meaningful sense in which we can speak of monopoly is a situation in which it would be worthwhile for the producer to cut back production uh, because he could uh, receive still a higher income. Most notably, notably, that's the case if the demand curve has a certain uh, slope that is sufficiently steep. If you cut back production, then uh, the price will sufficiently increase so that what you lose in, in volume, you gain in price. So you can increase your revenue beyond what you would otherwise have uh, obtained, which implies that there is some sort of a perverse incentive, according to Mises, uh, for the producer in this case to cut back production, whereas the general tendency uh, in, uh, in the market economy, in a competitive uh, market process, is for everybody to increase production, to uh, maximize his productive efforts. Now, uh, Mises' analysis was very, was very, is very subtle um, because he realizes he doesn't fall into the trap uh, into which virtually all modern textbooks fall. I mean, they, they make the same argument. They say, okay, now this proves, therefore, that we have re overall reduction of production. Okay, Mises does not say this. He says, okay, the fact that this entrepreneur will now cut back production implies that factors of production are liberated for other production processes, right? He doesn't hire as many workers as he would otherwise have hired. He doesn't work himself as much as he would otherwise have done. He doesn't use as much capital as he would otherwise have used, all while improving his, uh, increasing his revenue. But that only means that these workers and this capital is now available for other production processes. So what we lose in this market in which the demand curve has this certain shape, we gain necessarily in other markets. So from a physical point of view, you cannot say whether there's an overall production or uh, increase or diminishment of, of production. But Mises then, then says, well, the, the well, there is still a welfare reduction because uh, without this demand curve, well, the production would have increased, would have been increased in this, in this uh, first industry. And only in this sense, only in this sense, there's an overall diminishment, uh, diminution of, uh, of welfare. Um, that's a point that I, well, point out here, and you can read this in, in detail in, in, in the biography, because it's, uh, it's generally uh, overlooked. He later said in correspondence the following. Um, I deal with the extension of production that eventually must result from the liberation of non-specific factors of production formally bound up in the production of the monopoly good. I explain that this extension of production can only concern less important goods, of course, from the point of view of the consumers. They are less important because they would not have been produced and consumed if the more pressing demands for a larger quantity of the monopolized commodity could have been satisfied. And then he goes on to say, there is no proof for the welfare-reducing effect of monopoly prices other than the one I propose. Now, I, I tell you, uh, nobody, uh, apart from Austrians, in current-day uh, literature, understands this, this point. Okay, Nobody under, understands this point. And that's not to say that Mises is right on this, but uh, it only says he has pushed his, his argument, the reasoning, his analysis, to such a nuance that uh, is, 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 is unrivaled uh, e even today. Okay, it does not say that he's right on this. It's a completely different question. And uh, in particular, his American disciple, Mary Rothbard, has later on re systematically revised Mises' theory of mono uh, monopoly prices and uh, criticized this position. Okay, then we have two last contributions. Oh, well, let's, let's say just one last contribution. Um, namely, that, uh, in which, which he discusses, uh, the compatibility of Christian ethics with the market. 
And here I will simply point out that Mises in his original 1922 um, uh, treatise is very skeptical in this respect. He denies, in fact, outright that uh, Christ's uh, teaching can be reconciled with the market economy. Okay. Now this, of course, raises a puzzle. If this is in fact the case, then how come that capitalism arose in Christian Occident? Right? If these things are really incompatible, how is it possible? This is a mystery. And Mises answers uh, the following. Is the following answer. He says, well, that was uh, the uh, consequence not of Christ's teaching, not of the gospel itself, but of the church, of the Catholic church, who had intermediated these and, 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 uh, and diminished these, these teachings where necessary. Okay, so the culture uh, cultivating force, driving force, in the development of Western uh, capitalism was, was the, the Catholic Church, not the gospel of Christ. On Christ himself, so he says the following, the evidence leads to the negation of the question asked above, whether it might not be possible to reconcile Christianity with a free social order based on private ownership in the means of production. A living Christianity cannot exist side by side with and within capitalism. Ten years later, however, Mises had changed his mind. For those of you who only read English, well, that's, that's the version that, that you read in the, in the English edition of socialism, because here we have the, the revised position. In the second edition of socialism, which appeared in 1932, he added two paragraphs that gave a much milder and reconciling tone to the conclusion. Mises now claimed that Christianity and liberalism might not be quite as antagonistic as he had first assumed. They could flourish together, provided there was a new synthesis. Oh, he, I quote again. There might be an alternative. No one can foresee with certainty how church and Christianity may change in the future. Papacy and Catholicism now face problems incomparably more difficult than all those they have had to solve for over a thousand years. The worldwide universal church is threatened in its very being by chauvinist nationalism. By refinement of political art, it has succeeded in maintaining the principle of Catholicism throughout all the turmoil of national wars but it must realize more clearly every day that its continuance is incompatible with nationalist ideas. Unless it is prepared to succumb and make way for national churches, it must drive out nationalism by an ideology which makes it possible for nations to live and work together in peace. But in doing so, the church would find itself inevitably committed to liberalism. No other doctrine would serve. If the Roman Church is to find any way out of the crisis into which nationalism has brought it, then it must be thoroughly transformed. It may be that this transformation and reformation will lead to its unconditional acceptance of the indispensability of private ownership in the means of production. At present, it is still far from this, as witnessed the recent encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, which was published in 1931. I do not know what changed his mind. It is possible Mises had second thoughts on Christianity and liberalism as a consequence of his activity as a counselor to uh, the Austrian Chancellor Monsignor Ignaz Seipel, who was a Catholic priest and, and politician, who, according to many Catholic witnesses, had a saintly character. Mises also came to realize that other scholars worked to bridge the gap that he saw between capitalism and Catholicism. Thus, he would eventually characterize the influential Jesuit Oswald von Nelbroining as, quote, one of the few German economists who in the interwar period advocated economic freedom, unquote. We'll leave it here, and I, I give you five minutes for questions. You said that in the later edition of 
um, socialism makes the point that he has the quote, economic calculation always deals with prices, not value. Why is this such a, and you said in the 20s it was kind of muddled. Why is that such an important point to make? Well, because value obviously exists in any uh, economic system. Right? Value as defined by, uh, by uh, Menga and clarified uh, by, by Mises well, concerns the preference relationship that exists between different choice alternatives. I'm giving this talk now, which means I prefer this activity giving the talk to various other things that I could have done. And same thing holds true for you. So this exists under any economic system. So if there were no difference between value and price, then visa would be right and production could be ordered along according to value, value calculus. Uh, but precisely because there is this difference and value is just a preference relationship, nothing extended that can be added up. You have to rely for calculation on prices and prices only exist when there's private property in economic goods. Uh, do you suppose it's unfortunate that Mises didn't make more of the connection between liberal Christianity and socialism as an explanation for its uh, driving force, so to speak? Uh, there seems to be a leap of faith that you could, you know, that would explain how socialism might work, uh, whereas. You know, he does it purely on the basis of reason and logic. I, I do not understand the question. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with the idea that religion is what gives a lot of impetus to socialism. And I guess I'm wondering if it's not unfortunate that Mises didn't sort of lay a little more of socialism at religion's doorstep. Oh, that, but that's what he did. So you say, well, uh, you find it unfortunate that Mises did not lay greater responsibility to relig religion for the advancement of socialism. But that's precisely what he did in, in the book. And in fact, the, those passages uh, that, that are read to you in which he indicts um, uh, the, the gospel of Christ for uh, incompatibility with, with capital, uh, cap uh, capitalism, that remains in all later editions. He doesn't take this out. Okay, so it remains there, but you only add something. Say, well, but maybe it's not quite as bad as that. Things could change if the following happens. Um, you were talking about the three confirmations of uh, uh, of Mises' uh, theory of socialism, Max Weber, and the Russian Boris. Um, yeah, actually, I added Brutsko, so we have four four confirmations, right? Uh, Max Weber, Brutsko's. Lenin right, um, and Heinrich Herkner. Uh, well, uh, I guess I answered the question that the Lenin was, was separate from the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure if, if, if you're implying that, that Lenin's policy was in some way related to the book. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. It was not. Right. Um, and then the other one was uh, Brutsko. Yeah, that's right. Brutsko was a minor figure in Russia, especially after he was in, uh, expelled for his articles. <laughs> so who got the chair after Peter? Peter? Uh, Hans Meyer. Maya was one of those uh, experts in uh, maneuvering the hallways of power. So, and well, he he was uh, um, the the beloved disciple of the great Friedrich. So he got the job. Yeah, yesterday somebody came to me and said, "Well, I mean, that's that's so unjust that this Mises didn't get a professorship and so on." I said, "Yeah, well, that's not strictly speaking true, right? I mean." We always have to, have to consider, we're just, this was not Harvard, right? It was the Harvard Department of Economics today. I mean, there are 30 or 50 economists, uh, probably 20 or 25 full professors, I don't even know. In those days, there were three, three positions at the University of Vienna. And Mises was very smart, and of course, we think that he was the best. But, I mean, there are a few other very smart people around. So it's by no means scandalous that he didn't get the job, right? Well, thank you for your attention. See you soon.